last uh, speaker of this session is Dr. Jim Tickman from University of Chicago. Thank you for the invitation, and I've really enjoyed the session so far. So in this presentation, I'm going to identify challenges in evidence generation in the setting that we've been talking about uh, yesterday and today. I'm going to describe some study designs and des design innovations that we may be applying to evidence generation. And I'm going to describe in, in brief a few ongoing efforts um, in, in garnering evidence. And you've heard a little bit of that from Jason and from others yesterday as well. So this next slide I feel pretty good about presenting. I wasn't sure coming in that the only statistician speaking um, had the job of being a wet blanket on all the sparks of creativity and innovation. But what I've heard throughout yesterday and today is really a strong call for very solid and um, high level evidence um, for moving forward with these exciting technologies. So in any case, I'll go through these assumptions. The first one is that the new technologies uh, like any new therapeutic maneuver, it should be evaluated and tested against standards. Any therapy with broad utility should be considered amenable to testing. Nothing is exempt. And when we can, we should aim for level one, high level, that is, randomized trial evidence uh, whenever possible, even if it's difficult. And indeed, it is difficult, as we've heard um, um, repeatedly in this uh, conference. So there are, because there are new and seemingly unique challenges, but frequently these difficulties resemble um, experiences we've had in the past. And I'll go way back to something that, not particularly an innovative technology, but a, a profound change in treatment. And that was the uh, NSABP lumpectomy versus uh, total mastectomy trial um, that um, started around 1976, although the, the idea of breast conservation that predated that by quite a bit, and it was a, a large effort to even mount a trial. There was sort of camps of thought about this, but not a trial and evidence. Uh, this trial and its precursor, which actually randomized patients interoperatively, and we're talking about surgeons here randomizing patients, was met with very strong opposition and controversy. But the the BO6 trial was even more controversial because we were randomizing women to either um, preserving or losing a breast. And the accrual was initially quite poor. And there was something called pre-randomization was applied, which is an idea that it's a little hard to get by an IRB these days. But it was a creative idea whereby the patient's assignment is chosen, is randomized and chosen up front. And then the study is presented and is explained that there is a study, and these are the arms, and this is the arm you've landed in patient can refuse the arm and still be in the study, and that has to be accounted for in the sample size. It has an effect of attenuating any differences among arms, and so it, it adds some overhead to the study in terms of cost and time, but it's a way of, of sort of making the study more psychologically palatable and, um, and achievable. And it, indeed, it was used, and it improved the um, enrollment in it, and the study went on for a very long time, though a 10-year accrual period had completed. It led to the 1990 uh, consensus recommendation for breast conserving surgery with radiation, and, and to this day, use variations in breast conserving surgery and whether radiation is given as strongly indicated as we saw yesterday in the pr late presentation on a breast cancer um, um, radiation. Uh, it's considered an important care quality factor and measure, and there's still, like I said, there's still research in, in variations and sort of uh, usage. Um, we've revisited breast cancer surgery recently with a little more of a, a technological innovation, and that was sentinel node biopsy, which we've also heard about already in the conference. It had similar accrual challenges depending on the specific question. The, the NSABP, a cooperative group uh, sponsored by the NCI, led a trial to randomize sentinel node negative patients to standard axillary dissection to determine the true node status, or no further surgery. And, and, and the challenge there is that there will be false negatives. There will be patients declared node negative when indeed they're node positive. They may forego chemotherapy and may have a worse outcome. The American College of Surgeons Oncology Group took on a somewhat more challenging um, task, which was to test whether you could leave sentinel node positive patients essentially node positive. And, and, and for the most part, they would receive chemotherapy, which has a, a positive effect on local regional control. But nonetheless, 
um, leaving nodes behind was a, a real departure from practice. So that study was even harder to accrue to. There are explicitly non-inferiority trials, which I'll discuss at length in a few minutes, meaning they need a big sample size. The ACASOG trial actually did not meet its accrual goal and closed early. And this, this, these studies did have a, a more significant uh, training and credentialing process for the, the new technique that needed to be implemented. So all the while, uh, we're doing these trials, uh, trying to gather the, the requisite high-level evidence, and sentinel node biopsy has moved into practice based on some early um, studies, based on very early clinical trials with what we would consider intermediate endpoints. And there was even a, uh, this, this study sort of lamented the unequal access to sentinel load, node biopsy. This is showing the uh, rate of usage among different race ethnicity groups. Uh, meanwhile, we were sort of lamenting the lamenting, saying, why don't we wait for the clinical trials to complete? Um, this is a, a, a persistent theme you'll see where we're sort of racing to catch up and, 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 and ha have some impact when indeed these, these um, things are moving into practice. So the trials finally completed. The first published results um, were based on comparisons of recurrence and other what we would consider intermediate endpoints. The real critical endpoint is the survival difference. Are you going to per perturb the survival by misclassifying patients or under understaging them? Um, so there was much debate over these early and highly visible um, papers that appeared in a certain Northeastern regional journal. And then um, the definitive trials, what we would consider the definitive trials, did not appear until in 2010. And they show an, an important aspect that I'll get into in a moment with non-inferiority. Um, the sentinel node alone arm was about 1.5% worse at eight years in the NSABP trial. So you are getting a little less overall survival, but it was an acceptably similar amount. Um, the curves were not right on top of each other. Um, the ACASOG trial actually had sort of dead even curves with a, a, a somewhat larger than desirable confidence interval. But in that, in that case, the chemotherapy may have had a significant role in sort of evening out the arm. So the evidence finally arrived. So just to generalize from that, why are these technology trials difficult? Uh, there's uh, several sets of reasons. I'm going to go through sort of classes of reasons here actually in a um, in, uh, Stephen Pianidosi's excellent clinical trials book. He discusses these at length for all different sorts of scenarios of drugs, devices, and so forth. And we sort of follow those, and they're not mutually exclusive. Some of these maybe sort of could be classified differently, but these are sort of the reasons as, as I perceive them anyway. Of course, the, the regulatory part, which we've heard about, the, the lower bar relative to drugs, um, formal regulatory control in, in is, is absent in surgery, it's more of a key opinion leader and a, a practice issues, except when devices are involved, then there's regulatory control. Um, the cultural aspects, you know, the surgeon and the fighter pilot are the last uh, bastion of individuals that don't have to appeal to a committee to do something, and, um, you know, they act in the best interest or what they perceive as the best interest. So even patients perceive randomization to different surgical interventions as odd. Um, surgery effects are immediate and localized, so, so you know, the, you're, you're tweaking or you're modifying a procedure. The expectation is it will be as good or better, perhaps. And, and similar to that, the effects are in an incremental or a logical extension of existing treatment. When we vary, you know, radiation doses or delivery schedules, we're not looking for profound differences, so perhaps we don't have the same expectation of testing. Now, you could say, well, it's different and we should test it. We do that with drugs. Well, with drugs, I think we've learned enough times of the uh, unexpected, unanticipated effects that it's sort of taken as a given that drugs should be tested, but the same doesn't persist um, always in, other, in these other contexts. Um, and some just logistical and practical elements, um, the sort of technology creep that we heard about, the new things must be better, I want the new thing, we want to use the new thing, we've, we've installed the new thing, we should use it. And many trial elements such as blinding and placebos are either they're infeasible and practical or when they're done, they're highly controversial as, we, as we've heard. There's some particular statistical challenges that, um, some of which again overlap with what I just said. Um, the equipoise issue, the, the sort of the new is better than old assumption, which can affect 
accrual. When we, when we do trials in cutting edge technology, where it may be limited in the, in the scope of the study, where it can be performed. We talk about performing a, a proton study only in proton centers, of course. And so in, even when it's completed, the portability of it, reproducing of results could be called into question. So the impact is, could be lessened. Picking the appropriate endpoints. We're, in our trials, we're generally interested in long-term outcomes, both primary efficacy or not losing efficacy relative to standards, and then also long-term late effects. So, but those time horizons don't, don't fit well with rapidly changing technology and without the, the sort of bar, regulatory bar that keeps drugs back from more wide use. We really can't stop a situation like a sentinel node biopsy or protons or whatever from just going forward into the marketplace. And then the actual trial goals, the, um, the so-called superiority versus non-inferiority issue, which I'll talk about in a, a, some detail now. So I think we all know what non-inferiority is. It was mentioned yesterday, but the, it's, it's got some complexity to it. And this is from a recent extension of the, uh, the consort statement for reporting clinical trials. And so, so the first um, bar at the top is what we usually do. We have a superiority trial, and we show that this is a ratio of, say, failure rates. So we show that experimental over control failure rate is less than one, and the confidence interval doesn't overlap one. The next two are what we call a sort of a classical and appropriate non-inferiority conclusion and test and conclusion. The, the whole blue section is where we need to be here. Um, notice that the blue section is, is to the left, um, to the right of it um, is an area where the new treatment is actually worse than the standard, but it's worse by an acceptable amount. And so um, boxes B and C, those, those, those estimates and confidence intervals, you could see it's a little bit better, it's a little bit worse. The study wasn't designed to show it's definitively better or worse, so that's a non-inferiority conclusion. And then the next several get complex. Um, e is, is basically, they call it inconclusive here. If, if you got this result in a trial, you would basically conclude you haven't shown non-inferiority, but what they're it's calling it inconclusive because the interval is so wide that the data are consistent with anything from extraordinary benefit to harm. Um, D is a situation we, we probably wouldn't see where you've, you've demonstrated the new treatment is worse than a standard by a small amount, not a desirable situation to be in. Even though it's a small amount in the non-inferiority region, we don't aim to demonstrate that typically. And then uh, F and G are kind of messy, too, because you're, you're in the good area. You're also over the boundary. Um, and then clearly inferior. That's something we sadly have done by accident, shown that a new treatment is worse than standard. So this is, um, we need to be clear in, in when we're reading, when we're designing, when we're interpreting non-inferiority studies, what exactly we're talking about, what we're aiming to achieve, and what we're achieving. If you've ever heard a, a, a medical journalist at ASCO try to cover and explain a study that was shown to be not non-inferior, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. It gets very complicated and confusing. So these are some of the specific issues. Um, setting that margin of non-inferiority is, is not trivial and difficult. It has to be accepted by practitioners and patients. It can't be made very, very large because the study gets very large, so we have to compromise. We can't run a smaller trial claiming we're aiming for superiority and when the curves are on top of each other we say well we've shown they're about equal and just avert our eyes from the wide confidence interval that's not a non-inferiority trial and there's issues of, of trial analysis and compliance um, and the so-called a sort of sacred intention to treat principle where you analyze as randomized regardless of treatment received well in the case of non-inferiority people mixing up their treatment, getting the other's treatment, not complying to the treatment in a study, a trial, say, looking at a dose intensification or modification of delivery, that will make the arms become more similar. So you, you're sort of, uh, you're, you're, you're going in the direction of, of demonstrating that sort of uh, by default, which is not a desirable situation. So we need to think about that as well. A quick example we heard about yesterday, the partial breast radiation. Um, has great benefits, as we've heard. The RTOG and NSABP mounted a huge trial, 4,300 patients, to show that the PBI is not worse by more than a 50% or a one and a 
hazard ratio, 1.5, that's quite big. And what that means to satisfy that is the estimated hazard ratio has to be not more than 70% worse for local control. Um, some people say, though, that's a big bar. That, I mean, that's a big, generous um, allowance. But had it been bigger, then the trial itself would be even bigger. Um, meanwhile, of course, as we've heard, uh, PBI is in wide use. There's recommendation for who are candidates in absence of really good evidence. And there's a whole host of early results that are somewhat conflicting, somewhat based perhaps on the specific technology used. Um, and we're awaiting our results, and we hope they'll have some impact. Um, some other study designs we can consider. Uh, the cluster randomized trial, I'm sure you're familiar with, where we randomize institutions or centers rather than patients. That can have some advantages. Um, institutions commit to a certain procedure or another rather than the sort of complexity of, of patients um, going to one or the other has some logistical advantage. The disadvantages were intentionally confounding center and treatment. That's exactly what we're trying to avoid in, say, proton evaluation, because the proton centers, the patients, everything is different. Now, it's randomized initially, but then does that drift over time? And do the, does the catchment, does the accrual change? Um, serious issues there. But nonetheless, this is a, uh, a really growing area, because it's been taken up by economists and others to test their, their, their social modification theories. And so there's a lot of good methodology advancing here that we might be able to use. So what are the alternatives, though, to, to randomized trials? And I, if I was a proper um, trial, trialist statistician, this really should be blank, and there should be nothing beyond uh, the randomized trial. But of course, we're going to be a little more flexible. Um, so we're trying to achieve causal inference. And what is it? As the name suggests, that means to infer a causal relationship when we observe an association. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, well, randomization, of course, delivers that. And I don't have to belabor why randomization works. Um, controls for unknown and known factors, even yet unknown factors, like new markers. And it does permit um, higher level evidence when we go snooping around looking for responsive subsets. We can do that in, in, in observational data, but it's, it's even more fraught with confounding of, well, who had the marker, who, who was, how are they different from those who, for whom it wasn't evaluated, and so on. So it has real power, but of course we can't always do it. So what else can we do? Well, we're all familiar with just modeling. Model your way to the truth, the big data, data mining, and so forth. Or just straightforward modeling we do all the time in, in epidemiologic or observational data. We know the well-known shortcomings there. And, and big data is not really the answer because it just puts more precision on biased estimates. You really need bias control, not just big, bigger numbers. We heard about propensity score adjustment, a little more sophisticated approach. Match uh, individuals or standardize on the propensity to be treated. And that takes us a little further in, really con in, in bias control, gives us better evidence. And then something uh, more recent, causal inference methods, the so-called instrumental variables analysis, identify a variable strongly related to treatment choice, but not to outcome. And then standardizing on this factor standardizes on everything, including unknown confounders. So it's kind of magically like randomization. Now, this is a really new and somewhat dense area that, that people in health economics and, and statistics understand. I've just told you everything I know about causal inference in this phrase here. So um, I would encourage, if you're interested, to look at this paper from JNCI where they use the two methods side by side. And it, I think it's a good illustration of what can come out of both and how they might differ and what that might mean. It's actually quite, quite interesting and readable. Of course, registries, I, I need to mention. Um, high quality registries that, that have features that trials typically have, meaning active data ascertainment, um, clearly defined inclusion criteria, even data auditing would be great. Um, they can be more inclusive. They can have novel data fields that we just can't include in clinical trials. We already have so much overhead with clinical trials. But in registries, you may be able to include these additional information. And, and if we're going to apply causal inference and other high quality observational methods, they'll probably work better here. And uh, I think 
Someone needs to write a, a case book about data mining disasters, since we're talking about data mining all the time, the kind of m misguided results that can arise when you collect data retrospectively and you don't know the data well. In a registry, you'll know the data well going forward. And there's many great examples that I don't have time to uh, go through, but it's many of these you've heard about here at the meeting. So a brief departure here is who should do the studies? There's advantages to uh, single institutions or small networks doing trials. They have a certain nimbleness and ability to adapt quicker to the, the changes. Um, the cons are they're building infrastructure for trials that already exist elsewhere, issues of generalizability and catchment. The big networks, of course, have the experience and the infrastructure but they have a large management structure, committees, and so on. And they have competing priorities. And in our group, we're still evaluating uh, many standard questions in radiation therapy um, based on, on current technology, sort of a comparative effectiveness question. We're also evaluating a lot of uh, agents, even though the, the RTOG um, historically focused on radiation therapy by the time they merged, only about a quarter of their trials had a radiation primary question or really looking at drugs and other things. So there's other studies going on that need patients to be accrued. So the answer, who should do it? Of course, everyone. The network should do these studies. The institution-led studies, like the one Jason talked about, are a great example. And then in partnerships between these. And the U19 collaboration is permitting <clears throat> MGH and MD Anderson to do early phases, and then the network do later phases. Um, the PCORI project that, that Justin Beckelman is leading, uh, UPenn and, and um, Energy Oncology are working for left-sided advanced breast cancer, uh, proton versus photon, using our network, using our trial running machinery to run the trial. I'll just talk very briefly about a couple trials in the network, and I'm limiting this to a couple of radiation therapy trials and not our image-guided trials, and I'm also selfishly only talking about energy oncology and not the other network groups such as Alliance and ecog Akron and SWOG. So we have a lung cancer proton versus photon um, phase three superiority trial, um, 16 centers credentialed. There's a lot of credentialing work and overhead we're doing photon-proton partnering, for example, with Procure for centers that don't have both so that we can do a fully randomized trial with as many centers as possible from our group. And we have 40 patients enrolled. We're enrolling at a rate of about 33% of projected. Our data monitoring committee is concerned that's not terrific. I actually think it's not bad for the ramp-up period of a trial. We typically see that with, with uh, less innovative trials as well, but we're hoping, of course, to improve that. We have situations we do have to broaden our approach a little. In the uh, glioblastoma, we're looking at pro we want to look at proton versus photon in a pilot efficacy phase two trial. Not all centers have protons or partners, so how do we design the trial? We have confounding between center and modality, like a cluster randomized trial, but it's not random confounding. It's, it's, it's just incidental to who, what they have. So we designed two trials to keep as many people involved as possible. Um, trial one is looking at photon versus high-dose photon to, to evaluate its worth, and trial two for the proton centers is looking at standard photon versus proton, and then we're going to use causal inference methods to see if we can compare the high-dose photon to the proton, do the comparisons all around, and decide what goes forward into a phase three trial. So we're being a little creative and flexible with our randomized trial. So some trials fail. Uh, they fail for reasons we should have anticipated. Other times they fail, and we're not sure why. Here are two trials that failed. Uh, the ACASAG and RTOG um, SBRT versus curative surgery for lung cancer. We heard this morning and yesterday about the great promise with the SBRT. Um, here, we think the problem was equipoise misperception. Um, you can have equipoise in the room, but not in any individual, we found. So we, we go to our meeting and say, are you going to accrue to this study, or will this study accrue? And people raise their hand. And we assume they mean they will accrue, not somebody else will accrue to this study. But it didn't accrue well. We thought about cluster randomized and other things. Nothing could get us out of the bad accrual, and we closed it, unfortunately. Um, the transoral endoscopic trial, really interesting idea, taking an operable patient that would get a heavy-duty chemo radiation regimen and instead do, do, do um, TORS surgery. 
and then um, tailor the RT chemo according to how well they came out of that surgery. Um, it accrued zero patients in 15 months. Um, we have reasons here in this table as provided by the PI, Dr. Chris Holsinger. Patients didn't want to randomize. There weren't a lot of patients identified. There were several problems. We maybe should have pre-marketed a little bit and figured this out because it was a lot of effort invested and a study was closed with zero patients and crude after 15 months. A very innovative study that went nowhere. There is an ECOG study going forward doing a little better and so we're happy about that. So just to wrap up on well, where we need to focus, um, I think we've heard about the, you know, the, the, crit, the really key ish, issue of evidence, and we should insist on it everywhere we can, and that includes, of course, with payers, with insurance companies, as we heard. Um, use the best methods available and work hard to get good endpoints that are feasible in this changing technology landscape. Think about more creative trial designs and what we can do with those. How far can we go? Better project accrual. These, these study failures, they, they not only have huge costs and opportunity costs for tr other trials not done, but they, they set a precedent for these trials not succeeding, which we don't want to do. And then registries, I think, can be a really valuable tool of using, trying some maybe hybrid approaches like a, a, a registry with a trial embedded in it and capture everyone and capture information. Uh, that would take a little more uh, cost support typically than our trials can can, can do, but it was something to think about doing. And so just to finish, um, the technology, you know, it, it raises challenges, but they're not insurmountable. Patients deserve this information, the best high-level evidence for primary and secondary effects. And certainly in a current environment, the uh, systems and payers uh, expect the same, and, and we should encourage them to, to obtain the same, meaning insurance companies uh, hopefully can uh, be very supportive. I didn't mention Offhand, I'll mention the lung, part of the issue with our lung cancer trial cruel is also insurance denial. So it's been interest to us too. Thank you.